Good evening, everybody. If we could stand on this beautiful Wednesday night. We have a beautiful crowd for Wednesday, amen. The Lord has been good. He, he has been faithful. Uh, there's already a beautiful presence in this place tonight. And we're better together. We're better together. I was in the prayer room before before service, and Brother Tripp walked in, and it was the Lord just took over. Something happens when we get together and pray, amen? amen. And that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to go right into prayer tonight. Over here on my right side, do, do I have any, any prayer requests? Brother Kevin? Yes, sir. In my middle section here, Sister Leanne. Yes, ma'am. Violet? Definitely. Sister Eloise? Yes, ma'am. Sister Aunt Margaret? We will. We will. Anybody else in the middle here? On the left. Brother David. Yes, sir. Who did? Okay. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Sister Trish. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Aunt Margaret? Definitely, definitely. Sister Nadine? Yes, ma'am. In the back, Sister May? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Sister Fran? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Did I miss anybody? Platform? Brother Richard? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sister Kim? Definitely. Sister Casey? Definitely, definitely. Sister Meredith? We serve a big God. We have many needs, but nothing's too hard for him. Amen. Pray with faith tonight with me. Lord, we love you. There's nothing too hard for you, and you're not done working. You started a good work, and you will finish it. Lord, I pray that you don't stop drawing on the hearts of the prodigals. I pray that they are drawn here, and I pray that every time they hear of the Riverbend Pentecostals, every time they see us online, every time they drive by, something in them says, I need that, and I need to be back in church. Lord, and I'm praying for healing to sweep through this place tonight. Lord, touch every mind, touch every heart, every sickness. Lord, I pray for it to flee in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray for depression and anxiety and the voice of the enemy to be rebuked, Lord. I pray that we can hear your voice. I pray that we learn to listen for your voice. He who hath an ear, let him hear. And Lord, I pray that we are just as good of a listener as we are a speaker. Lord, I pray that you give us the words to speak when we witness, when we teach out in public or wherever we may be. Lord, never stop working in us. And I pray that we have our faith in you tonight and that you would stir up the fallow ground of our hearts, Lord. As, as Brother J David comes to preach tonight, Lord, I pray that he is anointed, that you give him the words to the words to say and the thoughts to think, and that it would flow easily, Lord, and that we can leave this place changed and closer to you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
And he is for us. Sometimes it's almost hard to grasp how much he loves us, Brother David. Me and Brother Shannon were texting about that today. Sometimes I sit back and think, and it's, it's, it's hard to fathom his love and what all he does for us. And in a world that's going crazy, we continue to be blessed. I, I, I think about the young lad that showed up on the, the day Jesus fed the 5,000. He had a little bit of bread and two fishes, but he gave all he got. Something happens when we give all we got. We don't have to have a ton, but if we give all we got, if we give him all our praise, he shows up. He continues to show up, and he is faithful through it all. If we could get the ways to give on the board. We have Givelify, PayPal, available at riverbendpentecostals.com. Cash and checks can be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostals, P.O. Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. The golden pans are for tithing and the wood is for offering. Say this prayer with faith to me tonight. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Lord, we love you. Upon the authority of your word, I have given, and it shall be given unto me, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I am a tither, and I give my offerings. I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, 
checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received, my whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in and I am blessed going out and all that I do will prosper. In Jesus' name, amen. Clap your hands and shout out to the Lord if you're not turning back. If you've had an experience with the Lord that said, I can't go back to that. I found my treasure. I found what I was looking for. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. And we thank you for what's in this place tonight. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Riverbend kids can make their way up front.
It's so great to see the kids in here smiling and looking forward to church. Amen. Amen. Violet, you can go ahead and lead them back. River Bend ignited. As Brother David's about to come forward, I look forward to what he has for us. I have much, much respect for Brother David. His knowledge is, is amazing. And he always brings something that I can take home and I can learn from and I can work on. And I, I can take it to the Lord in the prayer room and I'm thankful for him. Amen. Brother David. Appreciate you, brother. Appreciate you. Thank you very much. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Isn't God good? Praise God. I want to thank the praise team for the songs they sing because it goes right along with my word tonight. It kind of confirmed what God, God was going to have me teach tonight. We're going to talk about the Christian warfare tonight. We're going to talk about Christian warfare tonight. If you have your Bibles and you want to go to Ephesians chapter 6, I'm going to read verses 10 through 18. We're going to talk about the spiritual armor just a little bit later on. Praise God. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And that word wiles, Brother Ray, means method. The method that the devil uses. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand and withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is... The word of God, praying always with prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. If you will, will you just pray with me for a little while that God will bless his word and that God will speak to somebody tonight. Lord, we love you. We ask you, God, to anoint your word tonight. God, lead us and guide us and direct us, God. Lord, give me the words to say. Lord, allow me, God, to say the right thing, Lord, that your word would go forth and not return void, God, but it would set forth and do what it was intended to do, God. Anoint each and every one of our hearts, our eyes and mind, God, that we can see, Lord, that we can hear, Lord, and that we can understand your word and that we can apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 The Christian life is a battleground. Paul uses military images because the first century Christians understood what it, what it meant to. And I read in one place that as he wrote the scriptures in Ephesians, Brother Shannon, that he could have been chained to a Roman soldier at that time. He understood the, the, the importance of it. He was an ambassador in bonds is what the scripture says, Brother Blake, in Ephesians 6 and 20. In 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, and it's one of these passages of scripture that Brother Gio has asked us to commit to heart, to know it, and to understand it. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing them into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. In these verses, Paul speaks to us about the subject of spiritual warfare. In fact, this is one of the foundational verses on this subject. So it's vital that we understand what Paul's talking about. I want to draw your attention to three words that we'll find in verse 4. And those words are weapons, warfare, and carnal. First, Paul tells us that we have weapons. They're spiritual armaments. There's something that we can arm ourselves with, that we can fight against the enemy with. They've been provided to us by God, and they are at our disposal. And I made a note out beside it. You and I have to make that choice to use them. It's up to us. Miss Jane, it's up to us whether we pick those up and we decide to fight with them because God has given them to us. They are at our disposal. 
In Ephesians 6, 13 through 18, Paul lists them one by one and then explains what each one of these pieces represent. I'm going to try to bring it out a little bit clearer a little bit later on in this lesson. Second, Paul uses the word warfare. That word warfare means armed conflict, Brother Billy, between enemies. Armed conflict between enemies. That means there's a fight taking place. There's somebody that doesn't like somebody else. And that word warfare is taken from the word stratos. And by choosing, by choosing this word, he alerts us to some very important facts about spiritual warfare. The word stratos, where we divide the word strategy. This informs us that spiritual warfare does not occur accidentally, but it's something that is strategically planned. When an army goes to war, they have a strategy. There's a plan in place on how they're going to defeat the enemy. So there's a strategy. I will let you know that the devil also uses his strategy against us. He's got a plan that he's going to use against us. He's seen our weak moments. He's seen our sweet, weak areas in our life, Brother Ronnie. He's seen that. He knows that. And he chooses that approach. But that word stratos does not just apply to the devil. And his strategy also tells us that if we listen to God, if we will listen to the Lord, he will give us a strategy that is superior to defeat the enemy with, Sister Leanne. He's going to lead us and he's going to guide us and he was going to give us the key to victory. So when I think about that and I think about some of the stories in the Old Testament, I begin to look at some of these stories and I begin to think about the battle of Jericho. What he asked him to do does not make sense to us. What he asked him to do does not make sense to us. There was not a warfare that took place, Brother Cody. He told him, he said, I want you to march once around the walls of Jericho for six days. One time a day for six days. And then he said, on the seventh day, I want you to march seven times around the wall. And when they made that seventh round, they were supposed to blow the trumpet to the ram horns. Now to our natural mind, that doesn't make sense, does it? But that was the strategy that God chose. And you know what? When that happened, the walls fell down flat. I've read, I've read in history where they located the walls of Jericho and they fell down flat, just like the Bible tells us. Just like the Bible says, they fell down flat. Consider Jehoshaphat. There's a war fixing to take place. He inquires of the Lord and he says, Lord, what, what do you want me to do? He said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to put the praise singers and the musicians out on the battle line, right out on the front line. I want you to send out the singers, and I want you to send out the musicians out in front of you. And they sang and they played, Sister Callie, and the enemy was defeated. Not one shot was fired. Not one soldier lost their life because this was the strategy that God chose for them to use. That day, the children of Israel walked away from the battle without losing a single fighter. Not only that, but they were also weighed down with gold, silver, jewels, and other riches. There was so much plunder that it took them three days to gather all the spoils of the war up because they listened to the strategy that God chose them to do. Sometimes it might not make sense to us what God asked us to do. But he's smarter than I am. He's wiser than I am. If I learn to listen to him and what he tells me to do, in both of these cases, the line of attack made no sense to the natural mind. But it released so much power that it completely crushed the foe that they faced. So don't be surprised when you're fixing to fight a battle and God asks you to do something different. Don't be surprised by it. Listen to him. Listen to the voice of God and what he, what he tells you. Imagine an army that's fully equipped with weapons of warfare, but they have no strategy. They go into battle and they have no strategy. They're easily going to be defeated by the enemy. So that's why it's important that we inquire of the Lord, that we ask the Lord, Lord, what do I need to do? We'll talk, about, we'll talk about what he's given us in Ephesians 6 in just a little while. Although it's crucial that you put on the whole armor of God, that's just the first step. You've got to learn to listen to him. And this leads to the word carnal. In Greek, this word is sarkos, which describes anything that is of the flesh or flesh conjured. 
Paul uses this word when he writes, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. In effect, Paul saying, don't look to your flesh as a weapon. Don't look to your flesh as a strategy. I'm describing to you because they do not arise out of a natural talent. I have not a natural talent to defeat the enemy of my soul. I can't do this on my own. I pray when I pray often, Lord, I can't do this without you. I've got to have you on my side. You are the one that's going to give us the power to defeat the enemy. I, I'm nothing without you, Lord. I'm, not, I'm nothing without you. Don't look to your flesh. It's not going to be anything that I can do on my own. When you put all these Greek words together in 2 Corinthians 10 and 4, it says, Our God-given weapons are to be used in connection with a divine strategy. But don't look to the flesh to find that strategy for the battle plan. You need to get, you need is not going to arise out of your own natural talent, mental exercise, or your human effort. It's going to come from God and Him alone. Amen. It's going to come from God and Him alone. Now there, there, there is different names that, that, that is given to our enemy. And I want you to know that my focus is not on Him tonight. My focus is not on him, Brother Shannon. My focus is on what God's going to do for us. But he is real. You know, a, a lot of people have the concept that the devil is a little guy that runs around. He's red, got a pitchfork. But that's not the way it is. He was called the angel of light in the Bible. Ezekiel chapter 28 describes his jeweled covering. He was the worship leader in heaven. When the Shekinah glory of God descended into heaven... It would, it, would, it would meet with this jewel covering, and it was just so beautiful. But he began to think that he was higher than God. He began to think that he was greater than God, and we find out what happened to him. God kind of flicked him with a finger out of heaven because he began to think that he was something. He's called our adversary. He's an accuser. He is extremely wicked. Lucifer, meaning angel of light, the dragon, the serpent, Beelzebub, the evil one, the tempter, the god of this world. The prince of the power of the air and the ruler of darkness. And he has many tricks that he will try to defeat us with. He wants to imprison us. He wants to take advantage of us. He even tries to steal the word away from us, Brother Billy. He's not eternal. God was a creator. He was an imitator. He couldn't make anything on his own. He was a created being. He's not all powerful. He's not all knowing. He's not everywhere. We know God is omnipresent. That means he's everywhere. He's omnipotent. That means he knows everything. The devil's not like that. He's got other, other imps that do his work for him, if you will. The ancient advice of the king of Syria to the soldiers when they went out to fight can be applied to our spiritual battle today. 1, Corinthians 22, or 1 Kings 22 and 31, it says, Fight neither with small nor great, save only with the king. And the king's on our side tonight. I said the king is on our side tonight. It's vital. It's vital for us as a Christian in the days that we live in to learn how to put on that whole armor of God. Sister Rita, you've talked about it before about praying on the armor of God. Praying on that armor of God. Not just part of it. You can't pick and choose what you want to put on. You've got to put all of it on. Put all of it on. It's a spiritual battle that we are in. The term that you may be able to stand reveals to us much about early warfare. The soldier still standing at the end of the battle was the winner. And it will always be God's will that we are standing as winners when this contest of life is over. When the contest of life is over. One writer said that a Christian who has no conflict if you have no trouble in your life, if you have no conflict in your life, then you probably already retreated from the front lines and you've done gone AWOL. You're not there fighting in the battle. You've already given in, if you will. We've heard about an armor bearer, an armor bearer, and I've got a couple books by Jay Nance that talks about the armor bearer. An armor bearer is somebody that will step up and do whatever's asked of them. An armor bearer will stand up and whatever the pastor asks, they'll be willing to do it. But we've got to be spiritual armor bearers also. 
Brother Bucky, you probably know a lot about this, but a military soldier will never go into battle without all his uniform on. He will never go into battle without all his armor on. It distinguishes his identity. It distinguishes who he is. It distinguishes what division he belongs to. He will never remove the protective armor while in the battle because it could be the difference between life or death. And that's the same way it is spiritually. It could be a difference between life or death. As a Christian, our armor is our protection. That's why Paul tells us to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil or the schemes or the deception of the devil. Paul tells us three times within this scripture, in verse 11, verse 13, and verse 14, he says, stand, stand, stand. We have to stand and not be willing to retreat. To leave off even one piece is to leave some area of our lives exposed and leave us open to be wounded or hurt. Some of us may have never fought a fight, a physical battle, and some of you may have. I will tell you that I prefer not to fight. I prefer not to fight. Physical battle. But there's spiritual battles that we're going to have to face. One of the most important things you and, I have, you and I have to know in a fight is the strength and the weaknesses of our enemy. What you and I put on determines the victory that we experience. We have to dress for victory every morning when we await for a new day. Military forces, before going to war, have a battle plan. They are strategically planned. They study their enemy and they know their weakness and the strengths of their enemy. And they're going to attack them Accordingly, 2 Corinthians 2 and 11 says, Lest Satan, Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. And Paul tells us, Finally, brother, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. That phrase, be strong, comes from the Greek word, endomino. And it means to be continually strengthened in the Lord, to be renewed over and over and over. David said in the Old Testament, in the book of Psalms, he said he encouraged himself in the Lord. He strengthened himself in the Lord because he knew that he had to do it every day. Every day that he had to do it. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthened me. Not of my own power. It's not of my own will, but it comes from God. One of the first pieces of armor that he tells us to put on, Brother Blake, is the belt of truth. And I wrote out beside it, it's most important. Because when you study the armor that a soldier puts on and you begin to read about it. The first piece of armor Paul tells us about is having to stand our loins girt about with truth. Roman soldiers girded themselves with a belt from which hung strips of leather to protect their lower body, their lower abdomen, their lower will, if you will. And it was, and it was fastened. The armor, the girdle or the belt was fastened around the weight by ends of the breastplate so it was held in place all the other pieces of the armor was held in place by the belt of truth. Without that on, all their armor would fall off. So it was very important that they had on this belt, if you will, around their waist. When you, when you study in the scriptures, our loins, our waist, are our vital parts of our body. We are to gird our loins with truth. And the truth to us is the word of God. John 8, 31 and 32 says, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. Jesus prayed for his disciples, and in John 17, 14 through 18, he said, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them because they are not of this world. Even as I am not of the world, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of this world, but thou shouldest keep them from evil. They are not of this world, even as I am not of this world. Sanctify or cleanse them through thy word, which is truth, as thou hast sent me into the world. Truth is truth. You don't have to defend the truth. You don't have to defend the truth. When it's truth, it's truth. You have no explanation for it. Our truth 
which is the gospel, which is talked about in 1 Corinthians 15. Brother Gio mentioned it Sunday morning, I believe. It's the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's repentance at an altar, dying out to my sins. It's baptism in Jesus' name, being immersed completely in water, and it's receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. That is the plan of salvation. It is Acts 2.38. That is the truth that we stand on. The truth is the standard by which we live. It's the truth is what we're going to be measured by. If we live by it, it is the truth. This is why it's critical that you and I study and know the truth because it's what we gird ourselves about with every day. To know the Word of God. To have the Word of God in our heart. To memorize, Brother Billy, the Word of God. To know that. To be able to call it to remembrance, if you will. To gird up your loins in the Roman era meant to draw up or tie your lower garment. They wore robes back in those days. And the men would be able to take their robes and be able to tie them up between their legs so they could run swift, so they could run fast. Because what would happen if that would, would come apart? It would, they would lose mobility or they would lose agility. So they gird up their loins. So it's very important that we know that we got to gird up our loins of our mind with truth. That anything come against us that we're not going to stumble, that we're not going to fall. But we're standing on solid ground. We're standing on the Word of God. We're standing on the knowledge of the Word of God and the truth of God. That we apply it to our life and that we know it. Amen. Because our enemy knows the Word. He knows the Word. How do you think Jesus defeated him in Matthew chapter 4? He come to him at a weak point, at a weak place. Fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And he began to tempt him, if you will. And the Lord said, it is written. He began to say, it is written. He began to call to Scripture, to mind the Scriptures and defeat him with the Scriptures. The second piece of, uh, of armor is the breastplate of righteousness. The Roman soldier's breastplate was made of metal plates, chains, or hard leather, and it covered the body from the neck to the waist. Both front and back, and the ones made of large pieces of metal were molded or hardened to conform to the body. This piece of armor provided protection to the vital organs such as the heart and the lungs. And Webster's Dictionary defines righteousness as integrity or impurity of the heart. The Bible says that we're not righteous. We have no righteousness. Our righteousness was as filthy rags. Our righteousness will come from God. Romans 3 and 22 says even the righteousness of God which is by faith Jesus Christ and to all and upon them that believe but there is no, no difference. We change the way that we live and conduct ourselves when we're forgiven of our sins. It's a new lifestyle. Amen. It's a new way of life. Our old life has passed away. We conduct ourselves differently because we've been made right by Jesus Christ. Amen. We've been sanctified or we've been cleansed by Jesus Christ through the death, burial, and the resurrection. Romans 6, 13 and 14 says, Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead. And as your members are instruments of righteousness unto God, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Brother Ronnie, the basic meaning of the word righteousness is to be made right before God and to be made right with God. Our, bless, our breastplate of righteousness protects our hearts. Proverbs 4 and 23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. Everything comes from within. It comes from our heart. Be careful. Matthew 15 and 18 says, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart and defile the man. It controls our speech. Luke 6 and 45 says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man... Out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For all the, uh, out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. We are to be clothed with the breastplate of righteousness both in character and in conduct. By the way I act, by the way that I conduct myself. Wherever I'm at, it never changes. I said it never changes. No matter where I'm at. It's no different if I'm in the church or if I'm at work. It's got to be the same. It's got to be the same. 
The breastplate provides protection for the hearts, lungs, and the intestines and other vital organs. In the ancient Jewish thinking, the heart represented the mind and the will and the bowels represented the emotions and the feelings of man. It is Satan's goal to attack what we know in our hearts. To upset our emotional balance because if we become easily discouraged, then he can have us. Then he can have us, Brother Shane. And true righteousness has always originated from God and is his standard of motive. Each and every day, we put on the breastplate of righteousness, which comes from God. Because Romans, or Revelation 12 and 10 tells us that our enemy, the accuser of the brethren, will cause us to accuse ourselves. He will cause us to accuse others. He's standing there, and he's, he's accusing us of different things. When we do not wear the breastplate of righteousness, we leave ourselves open to the loss of joy and fruitfulness in our life, Brother Blake. How many of you like to have good shoes? Yeah, I do too. I thought this was, while the belt of truth is very important, this is also something that we need to look at, that we need to think about. But it says having your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In Paul's time, when we're talking about warfare, we're talking about times of war, we're talking about guys marching, Brother Billy, we're talking about guys walking down dusty roads. Roman and Jewish citizens normally wore uh, light sandals, sometimes decorated with metal or jewels. But Roman soldiers wore a pair of heavy, thick-soled shoes with leather straps that secured it to the foot. And on the bottom of the sole were little pieces of metal that protruded out of it like spikes to give the soldier better traction so that he could stand in the battle and in a hands-to-hand combat. It's almost like he had cleats on like you would see a ball player wear. Because it was very important in battle that he was able to get some traction. It was very important in battle that he was able to stand and that he would not be easily knocked apart or knocked aside. He had to be able to stand. The enemy would often place razor-sharp sticks in the ground in hopes of piercing the feet of the advancing soldiers. So it was very important what they had on their feet. The covering of the feet is personal. We're to cover our feet with the preparation or the readiness before we enter into battle. If we are not ready, we will not be able to stand against the wiles of the method of the devil and having done all to stand. It, provi- it provides a Christian with a solid foundation. And David says in Psalms 40 and 2, it says, He had brought me out of the horrible pit and out of the miry clay. And he has set my foot upon a rock and established my going. How important is peace in the world that we live in today? Not talking about worldwide, but even on an individual basis. It seems like, and I I told my wife today, and I probably shouldn't say this, but it just seems like my anxiety level is just right here. You know what I'm talking about? So when I'm like that, Sister Eloise, it's hard for me to have peace. It's hard for me, Brother Shannon, to be content. It's hard for me to be able to focus on what I need to focus on when I've got that anxiety going on. So many so many things happening, so many things going on. And, and, and I know it shouldn't be that way, but we're human. We're human. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes it's that way. So when we're to prepare our feet with the gospel of the peace, we stand firm in peace. And peace can only come from God. Peace is a fruit of the Spirit. It's something that is produced in our life. When I've, taught, when I've taught on the fruit of the Spirit, you have to be connected to Jesus Christ. When you talk about the true vine, you have to be connected to Jesus Christ. So to produce peace, I've got to be connected to Him. And I'm connected to Him through my prayer life. I'm connected to Him through my faith. So when I, when I talk about peace... There's two aspects of peace when you think about it like this. There is the peace with God, and there is the peace of God. Peace with God and the peace of God. Webster's defines peace as the state of quiet, calm, tranquility. It's the absence of mental conflict, serenity, freedom of war. We, We experience real peace when we experience God's spirit. 
His peace enables us to fight against the devil because we know that through God, we can be victorious when we stand firm. Peace, as I said, is a fruit of the Spirit. It comes from being connected to God. And once we are at peace with God, once we are at peace with God, then we have the peace of God. Once I have peace with God, then I have the peace of God in my life. One writer said the fruit of the peace, the fruit of peace is a rare fruit for Christians to have because it seems that we are constantly being attacked on every side. The enemy of our soul, he tries to keep our lives in turmoil and so full of problems that it's hard for us to have peace in our lives. Anybody else find that to be true? It's the way it is. It's the world that we live in. The things that we have to go through. Jesus said in John 14 and 27, he said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. He said, Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The peace of God comes from above and is able to rise above all difficulty. Peace settles, peace strengthens, and peace stabilizes us. Philippians 4 and 7 says, In the peace of God, which passes all understanding, when there's turmoil going on in our life, when there's conflict going on in our lives, when things are happening that we have no explanation in, God gives us peace. It's a peace that passes all understanding. I don't understand that how I'm standing through all these difficulties, that how I'm standing through all these trials, that I'm going through all these things, that I've got peace. Because it comes from God. It's an inner peace that comes from God. It passes all understanding and it shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Isaiah 26, 3 and 4 says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. It's where my focus is at. It's where my concentration is at. It's what I choose to think about. It's what I choose to go through my thought process. I'm thinking on him. Because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. My peace is going to come through the strength of God. God's peace literally garrisons us. It's like placing a platoon of soldiers in front of us when we have the peace of God. It protects us from all these things that I was talking about that's going on in my life by live storms or by attack of the enemy because true peace comes from God being in control of my life. When I experience that, Sister Eloise, when I experience that turmoil and I experience that anxiety that's going on, then I'm asking myself, is God in control? You know, is he in true control or am I trying to take control of my life like we all do? Having our feet shod with the preparation of peace gives us stability to stand against the wiles of the tricks of the enemy. We must have stability in our walk with God. And Paul tells us in Ephesians 4 and 14 that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they wait and wait to deceive. If we are not grounded in the word of God, we can easily be led astray. Instability will hinder and destroy our spiritual walk with God because the gospel is the foundation on which I stand. Our shoes give us balance. You ever try to walk on a hot gravel or, or pavement without your shoes on? It hurts. Now, when I was a kid and I ran around barefooted about half the time, it wasn't so bad. But I couldn't do it today. My feet would be so tender. Your balance is thrown off. Our enemy will try to unbalance us. Balance is vital for us to be able to stand and stand on solid ground. Our shoes give us mobility. Even the best equipped and best protected soldiers will be killed if he stands in one place too long. The Roman soldier's shoes were designed for mobility and he could move and turn quickly, adjust his position and so he can be able to fight from one side to the other or what was coming his way. He was ready because he was prepared. Our shoes will guide us in the direction that God wants us to go. He's going to be our compass. He's going to lead and guide us to those that need us. He's going to lead and guide us to those that are hurting, to those that are in need. 
He'll, he'll guide us if we're prepared. The shield of faith. The Roman soldiers used several types of shields, but the Therios was the most common. These shields were made so that a row of soldiers could interlock their shields together to form a wall that could extend for more than a mile. A wall that could be very difficult for their enemy to penetrate. Heidi, can you give me that slide that's got all, their, all the soldiers that are standing there with their shields in front of them? This is called the tortoise. And the Roman soldiers would march in battle like that. They have their shields in front of them. And notice what the shields on top are doing. They're shielding those that are behind them. They're shielding the soldiers that are coming up behind them. There's a protection there that covers all gap. And this, this is very essential when you think about this and you think about the shield of faith. Because he says, above all, taking up the shield of faith. Not only in front of you, but I'm protecting the man that's behind me. I'm protecting that lady that's behind me. I'm protecting those saints that are marching along with me. They were a unified force. When there's unity, there's strength. When we're, when we're unified, there's strength. The enemy would wrap their arrows in pieces of cloth that had been soaked in pitch. And just before they would shoot their arrow, they would light the tip of it. And on impact, it would splatter, burning, igniting anything that it touched. The soldiers with their shield locked together could easily deflect those arrows that were shot at them. Not only them, but those that were behind them. Just think how powerful that is, is when you're interlocked arm in arm with a sister or you're interlocked arm in arm with a brother and you're walking together and you're marching together. There's strength in unity. Charles Spurgeon said that he believed that the word that is translated shield sometimes signifies a door because these ancient shields were as large as a door. They covered the man entirely. And as the shield enveloped the man, so faith envelops the entire man protecting him from missiles wherever they may be aimed at him faith protects the whole man the shield of faith receives the blows that are meant for the man himself some christians think that faith should enable them to escape the blows that if they had faith everything would be peaceful and calm but be armed with faith because it receives the blow the shield is knocked and hammered and battered like a house exposed to a storm Blow after blow rained down upon it. And though it turns death aside, the shield is compelled of itself to hear the cut and the thrust of the enemy's sword. So our faith must bear the blows of life. Our faith must bear the blows of life. I got faith in God that everything's going to be all right. The battle's taking place, and I'm in the middle of it, but it's going to be all right. I got faith that it's going to be all right. I got the shield of faith. I got my brother standing beside me. I got my sister standing beside me. I got the shield of faith that everything's going to be all right in my life, no matter what comes my way, because I'm going to be protected because I've got that shield of faith. I got God's protection on my side. When we look at what the Scripture says, we see the importance of the shield of faith. It could even be said that it is our first line of defense against Satan's attack. Verse 14 starts with saying, above all, possibly meaning to cover the rest. The shield protects the rest of the armor. As stated earlier, our enemy Satan knows our strength and he knows our weaknesses. He's got a battle plan devised to use against us. And he never gives up. He will continue to throw his fiery darts our way. There are four common types of darts that the enemy uses against a Christian and their faith that they have in God. The first is fear. There is 365 fear knots in the Bible. One for every day. One for every day. Fear not. You get up in the morning and you say, fear not. Fear not. The Bible tells us that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. But the enemy will try to use fear. You ever seen anybody that struggled with fear? You know, sometimes, sometimes we don't really think that 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 
how, do, how should I say that? But some people are afraid of so many things that it actually paralyzes them. They're scared. Now, there's things that I'm afraid of. I'm afraid of wasp. I'll pick up a snake and play with it, but don't let me around a wasp. As comical as it is, it's the truth. I don't like wasp. So we all have fears of something. But some people have fear so great that it paralyzes them. They struggle with it. People will allow the fear to keep them inside and they won't even go outside. They won't even go around people. They're, they're afraid of so many different things. And that's, that's a trick of the enemy. Fear can totally paralyze us in our walk with God and destroy our faith with God. First John 4 and 4 tells us that God is love and there is no fear in love because perfect love casteth out fear. We can never allow fear in our walk with God. Number two is doubt. We doubt ourselves. We doubt others. We, 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 we have doubt about what God's word says. We have doubt about this and, and doubt is another, another, another target or another arrow that he uses in us. If I can doubt something and he can get a hold of me. We have a fear of words. There's an old saying that says sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's not true, Brother Shannon. That's not true. That's not true at all. What people say us can say about us, I want us to think about this, our words that we speak each and every day about somebody. Our words can break down. Our words can encourage. So it's up to us how we talk about people how we speak our manner of speech about other people. So we can either build up or we can destroy. Then there's the fear of confusion. We become confused in our thinking and our emotions and are not sure of ourselves and the things of God. But 1 Corinthians 14 and 33 says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. But of peace. 1 Peter 5 and 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary... The devil walketh about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The basis of our belief and our walk with God is based on our faith. And I've said this before, our faith is like a muscle. It's got to be exercised to grow. And Hebrews 11 and 6 says, but without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. 1 John 5 and 4 says, For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world, and that is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Faith is a substance. It is a matter or material which something consists of. It is us putting our total trust in Jesus Christ. When we as Christians take up the shield of faith, it displays a deliberate and positive holding on to God that has been revealed to us in His Word. Affirm Resolute dependence on the Lord which quenches the fiery darts of the devil. A shield is useless unless it's picked up and used. I said earlier we have to decide if we're going to use these weapons of warfare. We have to decide. The helmet of salvation. There was a couple, two or three weeks ago that Somebody in prayer, Brother Jill, had everybody come to the front. He asked us ministers to go around and begin to pray with people. And he said, before you pray, ask them what, you're, what, what you want them to pray with you about. And I asked this particular individual, and I, I won't say male or female, but they said, my mind. And I began to think about this, this lesson. I began to think about it. Actually, I actually got it out and began to look at it when I went home that day. And I began to think about it when Brother Jill asked me to to teach, I begin to think about this lesson of our spiritual warfare, our spiritual weapons, but our minds play tricks on us. He talks about the helmet of salvation, and it was very important. The helmets that, 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 they, that they wore were a thick leather, leather covered with metal plates or heavy mold and beaten metal. The purpose of the helmet is to protect our head from injury. But, John Michael, you've got to have that helmet on when you step on that football field. You know, there, there, there's people that put a helmet on when they step into a batter's box. There's people that wear hard hats when they work construction. They serve a purpose. They're there for a purpose. So this helmet of salvation 
is for a purpose. It seems that we're bombarded with so many negative thoughts every day. Every day there's something negative that comes our way. And our mind is the home of our feelings and our desires and our emotions. Our minds are the handiwork of God. Of all of God's creation, only mankind bears within him the consciousness and the self-awareness of what is right and what is wrong. And it starts right here in our mind. If the devil can plant seeds of doubt in our mind, he can cause us to question God. The term it, enmity means hatred. The carnal mind, a man hates the things of God. But Philippians 2 and 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The helmet was very important. The helmet of salvation. Salvation is redemption of man from sin, the knowledge that we have. From Jesus Christ who died so that you and I could have the promise of eternal life. The sword of the spirit. The Roman soldier used a sword called a makara, which varied in length from 6 to 18 inches. It was sharpened on both sides so that it cut both going in and coming out. It was sharp. It was designed for close fighting. It was carried in the sheath or on a belt so as it would be close at hand. I think it's amazing that Paul lists five defensive weapons that we've taken a look at, but he only, he only has one offensive weapon that he gives, and that is the sword of the Spirit. That is the Word of God. That is the truth of God. That's why it's so important, as I said, that we know the Word. David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. It's so important that we know the Word, the Word of God, which shows us just how power, powerful God really is. Jesus said in Matthew 24 and 35, He said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, my truth, my words shall not pass away. First Timothy, or 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And that word inspiration means it translates from the Greek word which means God breathed. In studying, there were 40 men that wrote the Word of God over a period of about 1,600 years. But they were inspired by God. God told them what to write. It was God breathed as they wrote the Holy Scripture, as they wrote the Bible. God told them what to put in there. And Hebrews 4 and 12 says, For the Word of God is quick and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intent of our heart. As I said already in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus used the word to defeat the enemy. He used the word to defeat the enemy. In Psalms 119 and 105, he said, Thy word is a lamp unto my path, and a light unto my path, a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It leads us and it guides us. Romans 15 and 4 says, for whosoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. The things that were written in the Bible was for our learning. And that we through patience and comfort of Scripture might have hope. We become strong in the Lord and in the power of His might when we have on the whole armor of God. We're able to pull down the strongholds of the enemy. And as I looked over this lesson, I really felt like somebody needed to hear this. Somebody really needed to know this, whether you're here tonight or whether it's going out over the Internet. God's fighting for us. Sister Heidi put that up earlier. The songs that we sing tonight was talking about being in battle, and it was talking about fighting. I didn't tell the girls what I was going to teach tonight. I don't know if one of them overheard us talking. I have no idea, but it just kind of led me and gave me the, 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 the knowledge that this is where I needed to go at tonight. We're fighting a battle, but we are armed with the weapons of warfare that God has given us, the spiritual warfare that God has given us, we can tear, we can tear those down. And in closing, I want, I want to read this. I said, I had a battle fierce today right in the place of prayer. I went to meet and talk with God, but I found Satan there. He whispered, you can't really pray. You lost out long ago. You might say words while on your knees. But you can't pray, you know. So then I pulled my helmet tight, way down upon my ears, and I found it helped to still his voice and help allow my fears. 
I checked my other armor over. My feet in peace were shod. My loins with truth still girded round, and my sword the word of God. My righteous breastplate still on, my heart's love to protect. My shield of faith was all intact, and his fiery darts to deflect. My courage mounted up afresh, and I gripped anew my sword. O oh, Satan, get behind, I cried. O oh, glory, praise the Lord. Again his darts came thick and fast. Faith quenched and put them out. And while he raised the new attack, I raised the victory shout. And I called on God in Jesus' name. And I pressed and I pled the precious blood while Satan sneaked away in shame. And I met and talked with God today. Amen. Spiritual warfare. It's, it's real. It's true. We're going to have a baptismal service right now at this time. Brother Blake's, Brother Blake's dad. Brother Gary wants to be baptized, and uh, he asked him. Be he asked him before church, and we kind of talked with Brother GL, and we we're going to baptize him in Jesus' name tonight. Ain't that great? Sister Callie, would you mind? Would you mind? Would you, right, Sister Amanda's going. Would you mind coming and playing just a little bit on the piano to give us a little bit of music? But we're going to. Baptize Gary in Jesus' name tonight. I'm excited. This is brother. This is brother Blake's dad. He's come from time to time and, and and been here, but I think he's got some health issues going on. But I know a God that heals. I believe that when he comes up out of that water, that God can restore him. God can heal him. God can set him free of any kind of sickness that's going on in his body. And I believe I believe that by faith. Sister Callie's going to play a little something here for us while we get ready. <laughs> praise God, praise God. Yes, sir. Yeah, we can. Hey. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord's good. Amen. Hallelujah. I've taught my dad a few Bible studies in the past, and he knows why we're baptized in the name of Jesus, and he knows the book of Acts. And uh, I would just like you to pray with me over my dad real quick before we baptize him. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord, that your spirit would flow through his body right now, Lord. And I pray that if he goes under that water, Lord, that there's healing. There's healing that comes to his mind in every organ, Lord, in the chemical processes, Lord, in his mind. They, they are stable, Lord, and that they are changed and they work properly. Lord, we're declaring it in your name, Lord. This is just the beginning. I know you have more, Lord. This is just the beginning. And I pray, Lord, that you order every step in your word of his, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And that no no iniquity can have dominion over him, Lord, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Oh, Jesus. Gary Wolferdine, by the confession of your faith and on the teaching of the Acts of the Apostles, I now baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. excited about what God is doing at the river bend. Amen. 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 All right. Sunday morning, elements class at 10 o'clock, church at 11 o'clock. Y'all be careful. Have a good night.